The Human Experience, Inside the Humanities at Stanford University, humanexperience.stanford.edu. My current research involves the Cold War in Germany, and I recently completed a book called Burn Bridge, How East and West Germans Made the Iron Curtain. And while we all know the Berlin Wall was at the center of the Cold War in Europe and is now considered an icon of political repression, um, the full story of the Iron Curtain looks very different. The Berlin Wall was actually only the final and most famous portion of the Iron Curtain to be built. And my research uncovers how the rest of the 1400 kilometer boundary between East and West Germany had been growing haphazardly since the end of World War II. So by the eve of the construction of the Berlin Wall, a lethal barrier between the two Germanys was already in place. I'm really interested in moments of change and Germany is a prime example of this. In the 20th century, Germany's experienced fantastic transformations beginning as an empire, transitioning very rapidly to, to democracy, then to Nazism, and then to communism in East Germany, and again, democracy in West Germany, and then the rapid collapse in 1989 of the Berlin Wall, and now we see a fifth unified Germany. So I was interested in understanding these transitions, and to me, looking at politics and institutions doesn't really tell the whole story. I'm very interested in how people change what they think, and to me, looking at shifts in belief and behavior is far more profound than looking at switching out new government offices. I've been interested for a long time in Germany's post-war transition out of the Third Reich and had done some research on diaries written by Germans at the end of World War II throughout the year of 1945 and was very struck by how quickly people were changing how they'd written about their experiences and their thoughts about Nazism and um, literally redrawing their mental maps of the post-war world. So I was curious to see how this process might have unfolded differently in both East and West Germany and wanted to focus on a specific region that would illustrate these shifts in mentality. My research in the archives, as most historians tend to do, looking for as much information as possible and following threads that I believed fascinating. And I believe I visited 14 different archives in both East and West, looking at all levels of government, city, county, state, national, as well as looking at archives of the secret police in East Germany and um, the National Archives US military records here. And the benefit of casting such a broad net is that you get such a multitude of perspectives on the same event. As a historian, I believe one of our missions is to represent the variety of mentalities that existed at a particular time. And one of the things I found most striking was the wide disparity of um, representations of even the same event between on different sides of the border. And the gaps between these representations to me speak volumes about how quickly these places diverged. So for example, take the crossing of one man from East to West Germany. That escape might be portrayed in East German archives by one official as the man's lust for adventure or degenerate nature. The same man in, represented by a West German official would, might be portrayed as seeking political freedom or um, opportunity. Often I would then try and follow up with these people that I found in the archives and interview them and um, in the process of learning how they remembered the event you might discover um, the guy had a brother in West Germany who was working at a factory and managed to finagle him a job. And it would be, again, a different layer on what became a very complex story. One of the great things in doing these interviews is that you really have an insight into these people's lives. Often their children and grandchildren would sit around the table and listen in or participate. Many of um, my interview partners shared personal letters with me, memoirs, diaries, photographs, even secret police files on them. And often these conversations were very emotional, accompanied by laughter and tears. And um, to me, in order to represent how the Cold War was actually lived on a human scale, these kinds of insights are really important. I think we've all realized how 
events around us have impacted our identities. But to me, one of the most surprising findings of my research is investigating how mentalities can in fact impact larger events and how the everyday actions of ordinary people can add up to something much larger than anyone has foreseen. And that often these improvised developments really take shape in lasting and unexpected ways. Most surprising to me is just how quickly people in these two adjacent communities began to see each other as different. A year after the end of Hitler's Thousand Year Reich, people in the towns in East and West began to attribute different values and beliefs to people on the other side who were in fact their neighbors. And um, so what you really see here in an area where there's no pre-existing language difference, religious difference, or even socioeconomic difference between these two sides is the creation of difference where there is no difference. And so I think when we're looking at the construction of identities in this country and around the world, this is important to bear in mind that even when you have a homogenous community, it's very possible very quickly to create um, oppositional identities. We all have a sense that borders can shape identities. And there's been much written about German's famous wall in the head as if it was a creation of the wall on the ground. One of the things that I think is so striking about the story of the rest of the Iron Curtain is we see how the wall in the head propelled the wall on the ground. That it was because these identities of East and West formed so quickly that Westerners were willing to serve as border guards and apprehend Eastern smugglers who were crossing. To me, when I'm researching, I tend to honestly follow the threads that I find most surprising because I feel that if I think something's interesting, perhaps other people will too. So I experience it like a treasure hunt. And when I encounter something that I find hard to comprehend, for example, West Germans lobbying American military for stronger security against fleeing East Germans, that's a phenomenon I do not understand. And that's something I dig in and pursue throughout different archives as well as in interviews. I'm interested in the phenomenon of perspective shifting. So I find inspiration anytime I encounter new perspectives that I find hard to understand. And I find a tremendous amount of inspiration in teaching. I think the challenge of translating past mentalities into current understanding is, is very exciting. And students are always interested in how people were thinking, what was public opinion. And um, in fact, I've gotten a lot out of one particular teaching project where I'd ask students to create fictional historical lives and really be in command of those um, choices and experiences of how people felt throughout history. As I'm starting to think about my second topic, I'm considering exploring the development of corporate culture. Today, I find it amazing that companies can create entire identities around their brand. So, for example, people working for Company X have a certain set of attributes and beliefs that are different from people working for Company Y. And I'm curious how that phenomenon began, looking at European countries, specifically in Germany, and the growth of multinational um, branches, I think, would be a fascinating way to explore that. I'm interested in the moment when corporations decide to cultivate unique identities. There's been a lot of scholarship on the creation of national identities, on gender identities, on religious identities. And I think one thing that remains to be explored is how people derive um, a very strong sense of self from the places where they work. And there was a moment when companies decided to cultivate this. The human experience. Inside the humanities at Stanford University. humanexperience.stanford.edu